Thank you for everyone who's made this event uh, possibilities. Um, and thank you for the background, um, which is great. I've never performed in such a background before, so thank you, nature. <laughs> and thank you to the previous speakers uh, for laying um, a, a very good grounds for, for, for me and us to continue. And uh, thanks to Grada for your intervention about the podium. Um, but I, I didn't wear the right shoes to expose myself, so I'm just going to stay here. Um, in, um, in 1975, and most of you will know uh, the boxer, Muhammad Ali, um, he was invited to Harvard to give a speech to students. Um, and from the crowd, somebody said, Ali, give us a poem. And he reportedly paused, paused for a moment. He looked around, and then he said, me, we. And this is said to be the shortest poem that exists in the English language. <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here today to share in Jochen's important declaration, we are many. Um, we also form part of our 10th Berlin Biennale titled We Don't Need Another Hero that I co-curated together with uh, Nomaduma Masilela, Yvette Mutumba, Thiago de Paula Souza, and Seruburi Moses. Um, and they are watching us right now. We had to think a lot about this we, about who feels included, who feels excluded, who doesn't have to think about these things because they are already inherently included. One of the references that were important for us as we embarked in the curatorial journey towards the 10th Berlin Biennale is the brutally honest, semi-autobiographical 1974 book, or a novel, um, titled The Question of Power by the Botswana writer Bessie Head. I think it's fair to say that Bessie Head was a writer from Botswana, even though she was born in South Africa. She left South Africa on an exit permit in 1963 into neighboring Botswana, eventually settling in Serowe, a village that would become her literally home for the rest of her life. She would later admit that in South Africa she could no longer not lever any magic or charm out of the political situation. In South Africa, Head was classified as colored because he was born from a, she was born from an illicit union between a white woman and a black man. Illicit, of course, under the Immorality Act that dated from 1927, amended in 1950, after the, nationalistic, uh, the nationalists took over power, declared South Africa an apartheid state. And several times also it was amend amended until it was repealed in 1985. These acts, among other things, made mixed race marriages and sexual encounters between white people and so-called nine white a crime. But before leaving South Africa, Bessie had started what was to be a brief correspondence with Langston Hughes, um, the African-American writer and poet, in, uh, I think it was 20 October, the letter was dated 20 October, 1960. She wrote to Hughes requesting financial assistance for a book she wished to write, a book nurtured by what she described as a feeling of despair, absolute frustration, and a deep sense of isolation, of not belonging. She described to Hughes how two months prior, she had sat drinking coffee with a young man who had been detained for four months. And I quote, he is the spirit that is at last the outward manifestation of 300 years of unrecognized black struggle towards freedom. And these long hidden dreams, humiliations, uncertainty, and the long, long hope with now only one exultant cry freedom in our time. He spoke with questioning deliberation. I will follow the masses. Those who are not with me are against me. For which I replied, I am not with you. I am part of you. 
He was silent for long, and this is still head writing the letter. I fiercely resented what I had said. Though free of mistrust, I felt incapable if faced with it. He is African, I am colored. Impassively, he spread his hand slowly, decisively, flat on the table. When freedom comes, he said, then we will sit down and drink all the wine we want to. And that is the book, a pledge of non-white to non-white, when freedom comes. This book was never written. Bessie Head was in search of a language, a grammar of inhabiting a void, perhaps. Today, if I speak about South Africa in particular, we are still in search of a language. We find ourselves again and again with conceptual apparatus that have become inadequate. And as Sadia Hartman puts it, pushing against the same hard rock. And Hartman writes, he suggests, we don't need a new kind of theoretical disposition, but a new set of kind of moral and ethical disposition about how we treat one another and how we talk to one another. To do so, perhaps we have to admit that contradicting narratives have to be exposed and represented. We need to embrace and face uh, them, and for this we need a language, a grammar, and refresh tools, and the right kinds of questions, a new set of contradictions. In South Africa, we have a, um, we say things like angazi, but I'm sure. So when somebody may ask for a direction, you might say angazi, but I'm sure, which is something which means angazi is Zulu for I don't know. So you say I don't know, but I'm sure. Um, and to say, I don't know, but I'm sure, may seem strange and contradictory, but it is within these contradictions that we can allow spaces for the speculative or for imagination to be free. As uh, in the introduction, Jochen uh, introduced me and mentioned the Center for Historical Reenactments, which is a platform uh, that are co-founded and uh, an experimental platform. And the first project of this platform actually was titled Xenoglossia, a research project. Xenoglossia being a condition, uh, a contested condition, when somebody speaks or writes in a language that is familiar to them or they have never come across. Um, and so this project was asking, among other things, how can Context and language construct both memory and meaning. Can meaning be constructed without definition? And I'd like to bring, um, just for examples, um, this work by Brett Murray, where you see a white man praying, I must learn to speak closer, which is one of the languages in South Africa a white South African artist, and a black South African artist, Ernestine White, the same year created a work titled, I Do Not Speak Closer. She grew up in New York in exile, so when, after she came back in, uh, in South Africa, she couldn't speak closer but English. Um, so Zeno Glosser also was interested in these kinds of uh, uh, positions, how can Ernestine's work and this statement that do not speak closer exist alongside Brett Murray's work, the mantra, which is a mantra, I must learn to speak closer. What codes are embedded within these two positions and what do these works reveal about post-apartheid tensions and emotional sides of cultural identities? And language, of course, in South Africa is a very topical um, question and has been for a while. In 1976, most of you will know that a historical student protest sparked by a rejection of Africans as a language of instruction in schools broke in Soweto and the rest of the country. Um, and I, I would like to show in closely these uh, two placards. And I quite, you know, this. To hell with Africans is quite an interesting statement. 
to hell with Africans. Um, because Africans then was used as a marker that can send us into a dreaded unknown. Not because Africans cannot be beautiful and complex as a language, but because it became clear to the 1976 generation that Africans was not going to be a language we can use to speak to the world about our humanity, to resist, to seek solidarity. Indeed, the protest banners are also written in English. But 1976 protests were not about embracing English so much as it was a realization that Africans was not going to be a language to bring freedom in their lifetimes. The media played a huge role in taking the message of racial, racial oppression to the world. In South Africa, the rebels of history uh, I think, I, according to myself and the people I was collaborating with at C CHR, um, these are best exemplified in the precarity of one archive of the late Alf Kumalo, who in 2003 converted his old house in Dupkluf, Soweto, into the Alf Kumalo Museum. For more than five decades, Kumalo documented some of the country's vital moments in history, the burning of the passes, protests, ma massacres, funerals, sports, political um, leaders, and all other indications of the violent apartheid state at work. Kumalo told of his many near-death experiences. More than once, he made the same deal with God. If you spare my life here now, I will never take another photograph, ever. He told of many strategies he devised in order for the image to be produced and for it to survive. Because of his initials of Kumalo, AK, the state, often raided his house looking for AK-47s, finding instead photographic equipment and images, confiscating some. In July 2011, during our visit at the museum, my colleagues from CHR and I were shown around a room housing his most iconic images, a dark room that was no longer functional, and a room with heaps of boxes, negatives, prints, personal notes, and outdated photographic equipment. We became curiously absorbed, the spirit and the energy that seems to hover over what was trapped, hidden, and covered in the dust in this one room seemed about to explode. So in March of 2012, we took a 72-hour residency, um, self-initiated residency at the museum, and for three days, we searched for the inapparent, for everything. We cleaned, we learned, we listened to Komalo's narrative, discussed, sorted boxes, bags, images, documents, equipment, people, more people. Some we knew, most we didn't, many dead, many survived black people in agony, in love at funerals and rallies. Mandela, Tutu, Biko, Onkopitetiro, assassinated Ali in the Congo, Ali, Bumaye, kill him, kill them. The archive was alive, the archive was dead, no. It had all the ingredients that make up a potential bomb and made us feel alive. They will never kill us all are words written in a banner carried in a 1985 protest rally commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Sharpeville massacre, which happened in 1960. Kumalo was there in Utenek in the Eastern Cape, or what now we call the Eastern Cape. It was the Transkei region then. The black and white photograph hung in one room of the museum with other iconic images of Kumalo. Seemingly unaware that the government had banned these demonstrations, the protesters were suddenly faced with police gunfire in which more than 20 people lost their lives. As part of the 72-hour residency project we titled Fragile, with Agile in brackets, we reconstructed the banner to make direct reference to the banner in Kumalo's image. To single out this reference was our attempt to reinstate the fact of history lived or a destiny foretold. Metaphorically, the banner makes reference to the sort of determinism, determination that characterizes the apartheid era. It is a single declaration to the state that no amount of physical casualties would extinguish the people's desire to be free. The statement, they will never kill us all dramatizes continuity of polarization, they versus us. The banner leaping out 
of historical moment revives a discursive platform within which the current spaces of struggle might be critically examined through its many archives. I also um, have a position at the Vet School of Art as a, a, a lecturer, and uh, one, in one of the classes I was talking about Michael Jackson's uh, um, song and, uh, and, and the two videos, one shot in Brazil and one that emerged much later shot in, in, uh, in, uh, in the US, which was considered too political and was censored. Um, but the song, they don't care about us. And I asked the students, um, who is us? Um, who, recogni who, re who recognizes themselves? Um, as they, uh, and who recognizes themselves as us. And this is a class of mixed, you know, typical South African class. And there were students who, who, who raised their hands and they said, I am uh, they, and, and others were us, and others didn't raise their hands. And I said, so who are you? And they said they were both. And for me, this was quite the most beautiful moment and the most critical moment uh, um, of thinking about these polarities they versus us, which very much still exists in South Africa. This photograph is one of several iconic images associated with the recent Roads Must Fall and also Fees Must Fall protest movements. This is the moment showing the removal of the statue of imperialist Cecil John Rhodes from the grounds of the University of Cape Town uh, on the 9th of April 2015, exactly a month after the beginning of the protest. And also visible in this image is a placard reading, we are not done yet. And I'd like to rephrase this. I'd like, you know, for me, we are not undone yet would have been an even more powerful statement. And this speaks to the active process of the self-decolonization processes, the work of undoing, of unlearning, is one that is concerned with the reconfiguration, reconfiguring of centuries of repressed vocabularies and their complexities. Fanon described decolonization as a process that sets out to change the order of the world, a process that cannot come as a result of magical practices, nor of a natural shock nor of a friendly understanding. It is a historical process. That is to say, it cannot be understood. It cannot become intelligible, nor clear to itself, except in the exact measure that we can descend the movements which gives it historical form and content. And roads must fall, fees must fall, are movements that have been such in the landscape um, of South Africa. And, um, and it produced also an image like this, which was uh, taken in Cape Town during the Fees Must Fall protest outside the, Cape, the, the parliament. And I quite, yeah, I like this image because it addresses history in the present. And I think to, to speak, to address history in the present is to speak to the future unknown. We cannot immediately understand in relative opacity how the events of the present will affect our futures. And this unknowing, however, should not stop us from undoing what has become obsolete. And there, this generation is, just has a simple question to the generation 40 years before in 1976. Is this a question, is, is it an accusation? Is it a cry for help? Is it pointing at a void? We can ask so many questions of uh, of this question, um, but this um, this this uh, photograph I uh, was taken at NGO. Nothing gets organized uh, because during the Fismas Fall protest, the students came to me. I had to stop class, and they came and they said, "Can we use the space to organize?" And from this space, they created um, um, these banners. And as a, an educator, I believe that as educators, we have to employ pedagogy as a form of politics. In fact, when I first uh, arrived at VET, the VET School of Arts to, to teach, I looked at these students, this generation, and I never imagined that a, a, a political movement could emerge from them. 
um, and uh, and and as a result, the first, uh, the very first uh, project I did with them was uh, titled uh, "The New Language of Protest." And uh, and and the movement sort of, you know, connected also the students with a, a history of the history also of the print printing medium, and they took this to the printing workshop. Um, and, uh, and also worked uh, with Geleketla Library, which is another collective in South Africa, um, invoking the history of black collectives in South Africa and how their modes became pan-African histories of arts education and transgressed borders in the 1980s. Uh, for example, the collective Medu Arts Ensemble, which connected South Africa to Botswana, to Tanzania, to Sweden, amongst other places and um, gave birth to this collective. And as you can see, the date it no longer exists as of now. Um, maybe I just, uh, this is a, a performance that was uh, done by Donna Kukama, where she proposed a free school for art and all things necessary until fees fall, um, which is quite a, um, an important proposal. There were a lot of uh, also lecturers who were supporting the, the, the students, and these are the kinds of proposals that are, um, I think are still revisited now. Um, this is a, a work that was produced by a graduating student at the, shortly after FISMOS fall, and uh, created these banners. There are three of them. We're not making this up. Uh, and this we are not making up, and finally making this up, we are not. And Simnigi um, Webushungu describes this as a call for emphasizing our narratives, epistemologies, mythologies um, that become an anthem, an anthem, a request for attention for histories which have been largely overlooked but constantly present, albeit not visible. Further, they bring into question of who are we trying to convince and where we situate knowledge production, who produces it, how do we produce it, and, how, and what do we do with these modes um, of, of production. And I just wanted to show this image because it's one of the, also the images that are, um, um, that are also addressing history that were part of the placards uh, of the movement, but alongside this image is also uh, this one that stresses that, you know, because there were many sentiments that all these students or these young people are making history and they had to underline that they are creating a future as much as they are making a history. And I will end with this uh, image by uh, Trinidadian artist Christopher Cosé, which we invited actually at the Berlin Biennale to be part of the public program, um, which is titled, I'm not who you think I'm not, um, which is also a statement that refused that which has been refused to you, if I borrow, borrow from Fanny Low Hammer's formulation, um, which was used by Fred, Fred Morton recently, um, by quoting, um, from a statement written by a Combahee River Collective, uh, of a feminist collective in the US, a black feminist, written in 1974, in which they say, we reject pedestals, queenhood, and walking 10 paces behind. To be recognized as human, lovely human, is enough. Thank you. <laughs>